Hello, I'm John Furness, and this is The Simple Truth. Today we're going to be looking at 1 Timothy. Um, to give you a little background on, on the letter that Paul wrote to Timothy, a young minister that, that had been traveling with him, uh, he left him at uh, Ephesus, uh, and uh, Paul went on. And he's writing back to uh, Timothy and giving him some instructions and, and things to look at and basically the encouragement. And uh, in the next few weeks, we're going to be talking about uh, Christian ministry. Uh, it goes along with our Christian daily walk that we should be on uh, and, and going forth. But, but I'm hoping that this will give us some insight to uh, Pastors and, and ministers that are that are out in the in the front, you so to speak, and, and teaching the word and and encouraging people. But this was was uh, uh, wrote to Timothy on a basis of of trying to set straight um, doctrines that were being uh, false, uh, giving him encouragement and a difficult task of of correction of the church that was they was having some problems and so um, as we look at this I want you to think of your own personal ministry and how it may affect your ministry as it affects mine so uh, let us get started today and and um, we'll just start out with of course chapter one of first Timothy um, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the commandment of God, our Savior, and the Lord Jesus Christ, our hope. Now, Paul is very plainly stating that uh, he was uh, commanded of God to do this. This was his calling to be an apostle and uh, a teacher to, uh, uh, to the Gentiles. And along the way, uh, he met uh, Timothy, but also it, it talks about our hope. And in our hope, what is our hope? Well, one is uh, salvation, of course, uh, through the blood of Jesus Christ, his sacrificial uh, dying for us on the cross. But it's also um, talks about also the resurrection, our victory over uh, the world. Uh, from, from being lost to being found. Uh, it talks about our hope is in righteousness, that we are doing the right things uh, and not doing uh, things against the word of God, against his commandments. It talks about God's calling on your life. I want you to understand that, yes, uh, we think of calling of God as being as uh, a pastor or a teacher or evangelist, but also I want you to understand that each one of us, God God has a plan for our lives, for each one of us, and that is our calling in general that God has for you and he has for me. And they're different, but they work together. It is needful to know that, you know, uh, we need everyone to do their part for, for the body of Christ to be working as perfectly as it should be. It also talks about uh, our hope is in our eternal inheritance that we have with Christ. Uh, it, it also, our hope is in God's glory to see not only God's glory in eternity, but to see his glory now through the salvation that comes from, from accepting Christ as our Savior, uh, from the healings and, and, and those things like that, but from everything when God reveals something to us, how much of the glory of God is being poured out on you and me as we learn his word. And then, of course, uh, there is the resurrection that that is our hope that we will one day be uh, this, this body will be resurrected and uh, rejoined in a sense with our, our soul and spirit and except it will be changed. It won't be physical like now. It'll be a, a supernatural uh, body that that. 
Christ tells us about. And then our eternal life. We're looking for that hope that eternal, no matter what happens here on earth, uh, no matter the persecution, no matter what we might go through here, uh, through those things, through the trials uh, and the blessings that comes, that we will still have eternity to hope for. And that's something the world is lacking right now is that that hope of the eternity. Um, we live in a time of lawlessness and, and hopeless, hopelessness. And uh, when we put our sights on, on heaven and, and know that we have that coming, uh, we can withstand so much things. Uh, and also uh, the, the hope of, of our conversion, not only ours, but those that are converted through the ministry that we might be in and that they're safe in heaven also. So these are just some of the things that we are hopeful for as the body of Christ as we as we go forward in the plan that God has for our lives and for for the church in, in general. Uh, so uh, there's our hope. And then in verse 2 he says to Timothy, a true son in faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. Now Timothy was not Paul's son, but he was a convert of Paul, and he traveled with Paul for several years. And then um, when they came to Ephesus, Paul w w went on to Macedonia, which we'll read here in a little bit. But he left Timothy there to set in order um, not only to straighten out doctrine that was being taught wrong. Uh, and, and false doctrines, but also the correctness of, of, of who leaders should be and how they should uh, live their lives uh, and, and doing all these things. And that's what this book is really about, is setting straight uh, the, the trials and tribulations that, that a, a pastoral mainly would go through. But in Christian ministry, we have some of that too, and it helps us to understand these things. Uh, we need the, the grace and the mercy and the peace of God that, that comes through knowing Christ. Uh, so uh, verse 3 goes on, As I urge you when I went into Macedonia, remain in Ephesus, that you may charge some that they teach no other doctrine, nor give heed to fables and endless genealogies which cause dispute rather than godly edification, which is in faith. Now, the reason that Paul left him there, and he's now writing back to him and encouraging him because he knows this is a tough job to uh, try to straighten out doctrines that were taught wrong, uh, ideas that were in, in, coming into the church that were not a part of the of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, and it was being taught in error. Uh, it talks about fables and endless geologies. Now here, here's something that, that uh, it kind of talks about uh, the fables that were told that were um, taken for maybe scripture but was not scriptural. Uh, and the geologies here, I know that we live in a time when a lot of people are looking back through their um, genealogies of history of, of, of where they came from and, and who was a part of their lives in the past, their ancestry, uh, and, and know that it was important for the Jews to go through that. Uh, we have a list in, in Matthew of the genealogy from Adam to Jesus uh, that is kept in line, and it's important to have. But what he's talking about here is um, people was adding to that. Uh, they was maybe making up a name and sliding them into that genealogy so that they bring some sort of importance to them, but it wasn't true. Uh, it only wanted to give the impression that they were a part of a certain uh, genealogy, a certain ancestry. Uh, so uh, the dispute was they, they was trying to bring something in that was not provable or was completely false. And so uh, genealogy, knowing where your past is not wrong, but adding to it something that is not there is. And that was what he was talking about because that caused strife in the church. It caused division in the church. And those things are not what the church is about. Uh, it's not to add a good advocate edification of the church. It's not encouraging the church if we're fighting among ourselves. 
never is and never will be. And, and so he's saying, you know, we need to get rid of those things and come back into the faith. And then verse 5, he says, Now the purpose of the commandment is love from a pure heart, from a good conscience, and from a sincere faith, from which some have strayed, have turned aside to idle talk. Now in verse 5, he's telling us, uh, the purpose that I'm telling you that we need to stop these um, falsehoods, these heresies that's in the church, uh, is not because of, I want to be have wrath against them, but it's because of the love that he has for them, uh, and with a pure heart. In other words, not being in hatred of them, it's my way or no way, uh, but but in the pureness of that, in the righteousness of that, he is expecting us to show love even in our corrections that needs to be to prove the true thing. The word is our final uh, authority in, in those things. If it's not in the word, don't believe it. So we need to understand that that's our, some of the things that was going on in the church at that time. And, and Paul had left Timothy there to straighten some of these things out. Um, verse 6, it says, from these, for, uh, from that faithful, true doctrine, uh, there were some that strayed and turned aside to idle talk. In other words, uh, they were having uh, discussions uh, about things that made little sense. Uh, it was, they was uh, debating over over this or that, and and that was causing strife in the in the church again, and it caused division in the church. And those things ought not to be. Those things are not godly things. Uh, they will tear a church apart. Uh, they will cause division and 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 uh, church splits. And so, what we're trying to say is, these things need to be corrected. Yes. But we need to just do away with them and stay with what the Word is teaching us and, and follow that and not bring in uh, some off-the-wall doctrine that's not of God. Uh, verse 7 uh, is still talking about those that talk idly or talk vain or, or have really no purpose to. Uh, uh, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor things which they affirm. But we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully. Now here, here again, uh, there was teachers in the law that was trying to bring uh, a part of the old Jewish um, sacrificial system um, and those kind of things that, that were done away with in the New Testament. And they, he was trying to say that not only you don't, you, you want to teach this law, but you don't understand it. You don't know what it meant for the law. You've misinterpreted what the law was really doing. And now he comes back in verse 8 and he says, we know the law is good if one uses it lawfully. We know that the law was good and that it was a a way of showing us right and wrong. It was trying to show us uh, in the physical a spiritual truth. And he goes on and, and he and he tells us that in this time uh, we we are not necessary to have a law. Uh, we need to understand why the law was there. We need to understand uh, what it was showing us. Uh, and it was uh, helped us to know right from wrong. Now, he goes on and says, knowing this, knowing that the law is good, if it's used correctly, that the law is not made for the righteous person, but for the lawless and insubordinate, for the ungodly, for sinners, for the unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers, murderers of mothers, and for manslayers, for fornicators, uh, for sodomites, for kidnappers, for liars, for perjurers, 
And if there is any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust. Now, he's telling us that Christians, is, there's no need of the law because our conscience and the Holy Spirit is telling us what is right and wrong. Here's a, here's a case that... that what I find in my life is if I have what, what we used to call a, 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 a check in our, in our spirit, whether something is right or wrong, it was a warning from the Holy Spirit that maybe we should walk away from this particular situation or that there was something wrong with this situation that we needed to correct. Uh, and whereas if it was something that God had started, and something God wanted done in our lives, then it was a, a peace that would come over you and that you could go ahead. And he said, and the law is for those who are lawless, those that are unrighteous, those that are doing wrong. Those are the ones that God had a law for. But we, we have the spirit of the law written on our hearts so that we know uh, in in essence, what something is right or something is wrong, uh, doing the right thing because it's right is is what we're trying to get to here. Uh, I can remember uh, not long ago that it was dark and foggy and and I backed into a car accidentally and. Uh, it had been so easy because nobody else saw it. So it had been so easy just to drive off and, and not tell anybody and not have to worry about the insurance going up. But yet, uh, in my spirit, I knew that was the wrong thing to do and that I needed to find this gentleman, which I did find, and I showed him what I had done and why, how it happened and uh, took care of it the way it should have been because that's the right thing to do, and that brings peace. I had peace about it, uh, and and he understood and had a peace about it. So uh, th that's the kind of thing that we're talking about. But if it was unlocked, but if I had just drove off and never told anybody, that was the wrong thing, and that's what the law is there for. Uh, we have. Uh, laws in the Old Testament that for each thing that happened, uh, if you stole or, or if you killed someone, there was a law and the penalties for that. So uh, we do the right thing because it's in our heart. And he said, also anything that's contrary to sound doctrine. Well, what sound doctrine is, is what Christ has told us and what Paul has written to us that through the, through the revelation of the Holy Spirit given to him so that we are doing the right thing and we are living this life uh, as, a, as a Christian. As it's, as it's said in the word, um, uh, not I, but Christ who lives in me. And, uh, and so we, we're living this Christ-generated life and to doing the right thing. Even sometimes it may be financially uh, harmful to us. It may be spiritually harmful to us. Uh, but we're still doing what God has called us to do and we're living a righteous life of doing well. And verse 11, he says, all this is, is according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God which has committed it to my trust. Paul talking about himself, to my trust, that he's teaching this gospel uh, to, to do right uh, and he takes this uh, not as a uh, general comment, but something that's very important and something that n needs to be taken uh, in a very uh, uh, honorable way. And so uh, we need to look at that also and say, you know, this gospel that, that Christ has given us, we too need to have show what the importance of it is and how important it is for the rest of the world to watch and see and follow through uh, for, for the right reasons here. Uh, verse 12, and Paul starts, to, has gone from, from uh, talking about unlawfulness to talking about himself here. And verse 12, and it says, I thank uh, Christ Jesus our Lord who has enabled me 
because he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Although I was a former blasphemer, a persecutor, an insolent man, but I obtained mercy because I did not did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. There, however, for this reason I obtain mercy that in me first Jesus Christ might show all long suffering as a pattern to those who are going to believe on him for everlasting life. Uh, let's take a look at Paul's talking about his own life here. He's saying, once I was just like these people we just talked about. I was a blasphemer. Uh, I was a violent man. Uh, he was a Pharisee and he thought he was doing right, but he did those things that he, that he did un, not understanding who Jesus Christ was. He spoke against Christ and he spoke against the church, which at the time was called the way. So uh, here he's, he's saying, I did these things ignorantly, and that's the same thing that these people that we talked about in verse 9 through 11, they're doing those things ignorantly, not understanding who they are going against. Uh, the God of all creation, uh, the Lord of God Almighty. Uh, and he says, but Christ's mercy and grace was put on him abundantly. In other words, he was completely forgiven of those things that he was doing wrong, though he thought he was doing right. And now he's given praise to God that, you know, as far as he's concerned, he was the worst sinner of all. And I think really any one of us that are saved, we could say the same thing, that we were the worst, the worst uh, before we got saved. But it was through Christ that we obtain mercy, and it was through Christ's long suffering for each one of us that now has become a pattern to show those uh, to to give them encouragement that that no matter how bad you might be, there's still grace for you, there's still mercy for you, there's still salvation for you, but you need to come to Jesus Christ so that that mercy can be obtained for eternal life, for the resurrection, the proof of eternal life, uh, the proof that we have to overcome. Uh, verse 17, uh, now to the king eternal, Im immortal, uh, invisible, to God who al alone is wise, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Paul ending this, this uh, sudden uh, example of his life that even the worst of worst can find salvation through Jesus Christ. It's not something that is unattainable, but something that is attainable, something that we can all reach. And get. It's just a matter of, of, of saying, Lord, forgive me. I receive you now, and I thank you for your mercy and your grace for saving me. Uh, there will be a change that comes over you, nothing like you've ever experienced before. So uh, he's given God the glory for what God has done in his life to bring him from what we call death uh, spiritually to life spiritually. Uh, verse 18 this charge I commit to you, son Timothy, according to the prophecies uh, previously uh, uh, had made concerning you, that by them you have, may wage a good warfare. In other words, Paul saying, with the laying on of hands, you was commissioned, uh, you was given uh, authority uh, through prophecy to continue in this work. And he's reminding him to think of those things. Uh, my wife and I went on vacation to Texas, and uh, we was in a church we'd never been in before, um, have never been back to. Uh, and there was a gentleman there that was prophesying over certain people. And he prophesied over my wife Bonnie and I. 
and uh, we got a CD of it, and we get that out every now and then, and we listen to that prophecy that was made over us, because we know that was God's word. We we uh, uh, knew at the time that that God was speaking right directly to us through this prophet, and it's important that we remember. Not only us being saved and what we went through to be saved, but also the prophecy that might have been uh, given over us. Try to think of a, of, of a prophecy that's been put over you. As a matter of fact, if you've ever been prayed for and, and a prophecy been given to you, write it down so you can, you can write it down word for word too. And so that you can look at it and read it and be reminded and, and reminded of what God has said to you about you for what you need to be doing. It is important to keep those things in mind, to meditate on them like you meditate on the word so that you are reminded I'm to be a blessing and to whoever God brings in my path. Uh, part of this ministry that I'm in now is from that prophecy uh, that was given to us by someone we didn't even know who he was and it came out. So uh, be reminded that we need to be a part of, of remembering what God has done in our lives, but also to think about the great things God has done in other people's lives around us or even maybe through a prayer that we ourselves have been able to, to uh, say because our prayers should be coming from the Lord and, and, and lining up with His Word and lining up with His will so that we can be a blessing to all people. And uh, I am thrilled that that. God has anointed me with this teaching ministry. I'm, I'm thrilled that, that there's been times that I've been able to sit down and speak to people and say things that they needed to hear. Not necessarily what I wanted to say, but what they needed to hear and what God wanted to say to them and take me out of the equation and simply say, Lord, you have your way. If there's anything you want me to say to these people, I'll say it. Is for you and you alone. You are the boss, you might say, and I am a servant. So uh, as you read on these things and as you look at these things, try to keep the unity of the church that needs to be. We don't need divisions. We need to have the love of God because that's the main thing. Love the Lord God Almighty with, with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And the second commandment is love thy neighbor as thyself. Those are the main commandments that we need to live by. I used to teach on unity in the church when I should have been teaching on God's love. And today, I want to send out God's love to you. Lord Jesus Christ loves you. And we love you. And we want you to know there's a place in God's kingdom for you. That you too can be a, a ministering to people the joy, the goodness the grace and the mercy that God has, not only for you, but for me and those around us. We'll see you next week, and God bless you, and we'll see you later. God bless. of Bible Baptist Church in Jefferson City, Missouri. Do you have a sweet tooth? I do. The Bible says in Psalm 104, verse 34, my meditation of Him shall be sweet. Did you know when you think about God and His creation, it'll satisfy your spiritual sweet tooth? Get in the book of Psalms and enjoy all those sweet truths. I mean, actually, get in all the Bible and get that sweet stuff. God bless. Hello, everybody. My name is Phil Driscoll. And I just want to tell you, we've got a new show called Divine Awakening. You need to call your friends, your enemies. Call anybody. Call anybody that you know needs to have a touch from heaven. It's going to be a lot of music, but it's going to be wonderful. I can't wait to see you. Be there, will you?